underwriting deals is such a major pain point for people. Most don't want to do it, and the people that are good at it are few and far between. That is why after six years of being in the industry and buying over 1,200 apartments, using my best-selling multifamily deal analyzer, I created Real Estate Lab, a full suite acquisition software for multifamily investors. We have built a product that helps investors automate their acquisitions and close more deals all in a cloud-based platform. You can go to realestatelab.com and sign up today using the promo code TAG2 for 10% off your first 12 months. This is David Tupin. Thanks for listening. Welcome to The Apartment Gurus, where twice a week, host Tate Seymour brings you deep dive interviews with the wisest gurus in the apartment investing industry. These experts are sure to create game-changing value and inspiration designed to catapult your business to the next level. Be sure to reach out to Tate at www.investwithgreenlight.com for access to his investor portal and Calendly link. And now, here is Tate Seymour and the Apartment Gurus. Welcome everybody back. Another episode of The Apartment Gurus is here and super excited today to have a really high level multifamily investor, uh, entrepreneur and uh, business leader on the show, uh, Mr. Spencer Hillegas of uh, of Madison. What's the name? What's the full name of the company? I know it's Madison. Is it Madison Investing? Madison Investing. Yeah, there's yeah. this. One of those names, of course, Tate, it's like there's Madison Galores out there, but it's Madison Investing. Yeah, yeah. yeah cool, cool. So um, Spencer, it, it, like I mentioned, is a full-time investor, former operations leader. Um, he walked away from a lucrative career 13 years with five different fintech companies, which I just learned uh, fintech is short for financial technology companies. In 2019, just five months before the pandemic started, uh, Spencer left his W two and uh, his that that career situation there, and he uh, he did that with the purpose of uh, giving full full focus to serving Madison Investing's pastor, passive investor group, and that's basically what Madison Investing does. They're a passive investing group with hundreds of members of actively actively deploying capital with Madison's vetted sponsors and deals in high growth markets across the U.S. Um, Spencer's wife, Jennifer, is the COO of Madison Investing, and uh, they put their own skin in the game. Uh, they put their own capital in, with each operator as the cornerstone of a five-part investing uh, betting framework designed to de-risk the toughest questions facing every passive investor, amongst which, can I trust this team with my capital, which is always the first concern of, uh, of a passive investor. Uh, Madison Invest Madison Investing specializes in real estate syndications and private equity funds, uh, focused on multifamily self storage and uh, other niche asset classes. Uh, Madison has partnered on deals totaling more than get this ten thousand units, spanning thirty six deals and thirteen full cycle exits. That is very very impressive. He's also a father of two, an avid guitar player. We were just talking offline about his music career and uh, and how that's really uh, that's really going gangbusters as well. Graduate of uh, Colorado University out here in the Intermountain West, kind of close to me in Salt Lake City, um, and uh, and and is currently based in the Bay Area, California, and is a, a registered member of uh, FINRA, which I look forward to hearing about. And is also a member of the Forbes 2022 Real Estate Council. Madison Investings, by the way, is accepting applications from new members who meet accredited investor requirements at madisoninvesting.com. And for you listeners that may not be familiar with accredited investing, basically to be an accredited investor, you need to be making either uh, $200,000 uh, annually as an individual, $300,000 as a couple, or have a net worth of at least $1 million. So uh, so with that, Spencer, welcome to the show, man. I'm excited for this conversation. Uh, I, you, you seem like a just a great guy and a, and a 
great professional and and i'm really i'm really excited to have you on the show man honored to be here tate i mean you can always kind of tell right off the bat when you're getting to know people like you know i think these days you call it the vibe check right and, and i think uh i'm just looking forward to it because i yeah. think it's really easy to, to chat with you right off the bat and uh at first i thought those were the rockies that i was familiar with from colorado behind you yeah it sounds, yeah. sounds like i was off a bit <laughs> it's not not too far off though well, yeah, it's the Wasatch. So those of you watching on YouTube uh, and those of you who have seen other episodes, you'll remember that uh, my background here in, in, is the Salt Lake City skyline that has the Wasatch Mountains right behind it. And uh, the Wasatch are a small range that's part of the Rocky Mountains uh, overall. But we're kind of on the other side of the Rocky Mountains from uh, from from Boulder. Um, so and by the way, Spencer, I had the opportunity to go see a concert at Red Rocks uh, two oh, weeks ago. Nice. It was my first time there ever. Uh, I got to see Amos Lee, who's one of my favorites. And uh, holy moly, is that venue magical. Like, what an amazing place. I'm sure you've been there many times. I have. I'm jealous you got to go so recently, though. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's been a proper decade plus, maybe 15 years plus uh, since I've been there. But it's outstanding. Oh man, it's like listeners put Red Rocks on your bucket list if you're into music because uh it's it's one of a kind. It really mm -hmm. I mean, there's a reason why people call it one of the greatest venues in the world and and uh it's it's just beautiful. It's just a beautiful beautiful place. So so Spencer, um if you would just kind of maybe tell us a little bit about your story and uh kind of how you got to to where you are today, um, I you know through the the fintech industry and what was your specifically what I'm interested in is what was your cue or your um, your inspiration to go full time into the into the uh, the I, I was going to say commercial multifamily space. You guys also do some other asset classes, but mm -hmm. what was that inspiration and 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 you know how did that how did you make that happen? Yeah, well, thank you so much for the thoughtful intro, Tate. Sure, you know, sure. I, I think in terms of the um, how how did I end up here, and what what do we do now, and how do I wake up each day and, and try to serve others? So I live in this little island community called Alameda, which I didn't even know about growing up in the Bay Area. It's like an mm -hmm. island between Oakland, postcard view, of San Francisco, and you know, now I just wake up and serve and try to grow uh, Madison Investing and help our passive investors as best as possible in 2022 because i frankly i think we all need as much help as we can all get mm -hmm. uh, I, I think uh now more than ever financially and, and beyond and so you know really what it's all about for me besides trying to just wake up and be a present dad to our two young dudes and, and a present husband and uh, to jennifer and coo or uh, his coo as well is like leading this company but i used to be embarrassed to say that i grew up in a real estate household technically uh, my dad was a broker, residential broker mm -hmm. for 30 years. And he used to make me work open houses when I was a teenager. And I did not like that. I just flat out would say I hated it at the time. I think really, I just wanted my freedom. Um, I watched him as an entrepreneur build that business to great heights. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, uh, our family had this period of time called, we call it kind of the dark decade when I was in that, when I was growing up and uh, my dad's business downsized significantly because we I lost a younger brother to cancer. I won't go too oh, TMI man. here for people, but wow. it was a long time ago. You know, uh, younger brother died of cancer. Domino effect happened, which is common in those cases where parents get divorced. And then we lost a grandparents shortly after that at the same time in a car crash. And it just kept on falling, man. Um, as a result of all that, I saw our family and our income go from this one broker active income stream to just downsize significantly, you know, and, and that really stuck with me. I mean, I, I, I wasn't a, you know, experienced professional with 13 years of tech leadership behind me and now 10,000 units of experience in real estate. I was still pretty young when all, all this was happening, but you just don't get that out of your head and out of your heart, you know, and, and as to watching that happen. And, now, flash forward, it, you know, we talk about this, these two principles of financial offense and financial defense in our household a lot. Mm -hmm. And those principles, which I'm always happy to nerd out on and go deeper, but I don't like to throw it at people unless they want to hear more. 
those inform our wealth strategy as a family and how to basically, how do we build a figurative moat around our, our kids, around our livelihood so that God forbid something happened to me. Uh, you know, life happens to all of us. And mm-hmm. I, I knock on wood and I'm just grateful to wake up breathing every day to try to go and enjoy and add value to others every day. Right. But looking back at that experience from my family, it really stuck with me using the same framework that we all heard from Robert Kiyosaki's purple book, you know, rich dad, poor dad of pipelines and buckets. And the bucket example he shares just to share this last point on this to hit it home, Tate, is that most people are trading their time for money. They yeah. do that in a day job. I, I did that as a leader making great W2 income for years. So did Jennifer in her own career. She carved out as a leader. And we would carry those buckets, right? Those figurative buckets, just like we all, everyone in a day job does. Entrepreneurs, if they're doing active income, brokers like my dad. And you pour that money on the table figuratively and you say, cool, let me go get some more. The pipeline idea blew my mind when I heard Robert Kiyosaki's example and I read that book, you know, and I said, that moat we're going to build around our family. And Jennifer and I set clear, crystal clear goals around this. We're going to go and do that and hit a, a dollar amount, a set dollar amount with a structured framework with some financial assumptions. We're going to put into a spreadsheet and we're going to do our best and work hard over years on nights and weekends and early mornings with the labor of love during our day jobs and start investing in real estate to hit that number. And we, we've now hit our targets. We've exceeded our targets way faster. We thought it was 15 years. We chopped it in half to seven. We ended up hitting it in closer to about five. And um, I'm just grateful every day to be able to keep fighting the good fight on that front to not, not just insulate our family because we're good to go now, but to help others achieve that same, um, that, that, that same path. Because this is not rocket science. It's just not. And, yeah. and I, I really, I know you know that Tate so well because you've, you've been so successful in your own journey. But I think a lot of folks now more than ever in 2022 need the healthiest, most well-intended kick in the butt. It just, mm-hmm. just, just to be like, stop letting your money die in a savings account. And, you know, they, yeah. they, they got to start taking action. So sorry for the soapbox right out the gates. I just, I think this is the right time for folks to pay more attention and find the courage to, to do something about it. Yeah. And, and not just, uh, you know, letting money wilt away in a savings account, but you could also argue that money is either wilting away or is exposed to a lot of high volatility in a 401k or, uh, you know, a retirement account, which, which is where most people, especially W2 folks invest. That's their vehicle for investing. And, uh, and they don't necessarily know that, there are alternatives or either that, or they just don't know how to go about them. Uh, A lot of people think, you know, apartment investing, well, that sounds great, but I'm sure I need, you know, seven figures or whatever to, to get into apartments. And uh, the truth is that through this, this, this model of syndication uh, you can get into investing in apartments and, and enjoying really, really nice returns that are risk mitigated you know, with as little sometimes as twenty five, fifty thousand dollars, depending on the deal and depending on the syndicator. And uh, and so uh, I love it that your your mission out there, Spencer, is is both to educate people on these opportunities and and like you say, give them a very I think you said well intended uh, something like that kick in the butt, like, um, you know, like a just a, a very um, loving like developmental way of saying that, you know, there's other, op- there's other options here and they're exciting yeah. and, and, uh, and, you know, here's how to do them. So, so dude, I just got to ask you right away, you made the switch in 2019, right. From, from the FinTech world to uh, the, the multifamily world, before we talk about what you've been able to do since then, what was the what was the inspiration specifically to get into these asset classes and and into this model of doing business? I appreciate you taking us there. I mean, it's it's such a in hindsight, like all of us, we look back at these key chapters and moments, whatever you want to call them in your in our lives, and it's so clear. At the time, it did not feel clear. <laughs> yeah, it felt about as confusing as a maze, right? And and looking back we break it down and Jennifer and I break it down in kind of a three phase 
journey. So I'll, make, I'll concisely just kind of lay that out now. It didn't feel this way at the time, but this is how it looks in hindsight, ironically. So I was working 80 to 100 hours a week in the most aggressively growing hardcore culture tech startup at the time that I'd ever experienced. And that was in office hours. So I know everyone's doing the great resignation now as trendy as it is for all the right reasons. Um, this was in office 80 to 100 hours a week, not including email time at home, not including on-call stuff or the teams I was leading and building and supporting, hiring t- dozens of people a month, mm-hmm. literally. It was pretty rough. And yeah. I, I look back at the beginning of that phase date, like what was the recipe for life that led us to kind of pay more attention and just have to seek out another path? We were mm-hmm. dumping, you know, maxed out 401ks. We were so proud of that. And I look back at that moment as we celebrated year after year for maxing out our 401ks. Is that a bad thing? Clearly not. Like, I still think people should use their company matches, et cetera. But sure. we ended up looking at this going, I didn't see my infant son, first of our two kids, for like a two-week period at one point. And it was mm-hmm. because I was working so early, coming home so late. So we ended up saying, oh, cash flow. You can go get this thing called cash flow. And it, it, it emerged from me working Somehow I got nudged by a mentor of mine in the corporate career into a prop tech company or a, a finance tech company that also focused on lending to real estate investors. Hmm. So I was in the guts of the biggest hard money lender in the country at that time. And we were doing 600 loans per month to fix and flippers. And I can't swing a hammer. So I was like, well, clearly I, I don't... I, I would hear stories from the people I that I managed. Like I was in charge of managing these guys. They were my direct reports. And these guys and gals, we allowed them and were totally encouraged them to build to do their flips on the weekends, nights and weekends, while working for me <laughs> and others at the company. And I'd see their hands in their their all the the results, right? The scrapes, the bruises, the the stories, the baggy eyes, because they were doing flips on the weekend. They'd tell me these things, and all I could do was have respect for them because I was like. Well, I can't do that. I don't know how to flip things. I don't know how to build things with my hands. That's just not my gift. Um, right, right. So we looked at, I, I read 24 books in an wow. 18 month period, wow. um, more than I needed, uh, <laughs> more, than, more than anyone needs. I think maybe six could have been the right number for anyone who's wondering what, what, I, what I think about that. Um, it was procrastination after a while. I, I listened to 400 plus podcasts in that same period of time, quality podcasts, just like your show tape, where people can really absorb that stuff. Um, and then I, I really devoured knowledge specifically about bigger properties because I just, my operations brain likes to forecast things. I like predictability. I like simplicity. Yeah. I like knowing that a financial assumption that I can plug into a spreadsheet can reasonably re- be recreated. And right. But we had to go through some pain in that first phase. So we drove around all summer. Yeah, and, and this is the last point on that phase one. That phase one was education heavy. Mm-hmm. And we were too scared to buy something sight unseen out of state. We live in the most expensive, one of the most expensive top three markets in the country. And yeah. we bought a duplex for $430,000 in Vallejo, California, which we still own now. It has appreciated significantly, but... We didn't understand how to cash flow goal set yet. What that means in layman's terms is you pay over a hundred thousand bucks cash on a $430,000 duplex. And that thing produces only $200 a month in monthly cash flow. Once every other bill is paid, the loan, the taxes, mm-hmm. everything else. And that's kind of a remarkable miracle here in the Bay area, at least to get cash flow at all. Yeah, and- for sure. But my goodness, six figures dropped into one property for 200 bucks a month in cash flow is different. So we went to phase two, we started buying uh, single family homes and we got up to five of them rentals out in Kansas city, Missouri. Those were 250 bucks a month, roughly in cash flow, which is a heck of a lot better when you buy them for $60,000 a pop, mind blowingly cheap from a Bay area perspective. So we were like, wow, this is incredible. And then we learned that rentals are not semi-passive. I mean, they're not fully passive. They're semi-passive. Right. right. Cause you're working a lot for, for those rentals. And, and so it's not passive, passive income where you're just deploying capital and enjoying the returns you're actually putting work in. Yeah. That's so well said. Yes. And as effectively, even with when we had property managers on them, you still had to manage the manager 
And oftentimes for a $60,000 property, that's going to be probably in a C-class neighborhood, maybe going down to D plus, just to be honest. And that means annual turnover for your tenants. So every time that tenant leaves or you have to help them leave, unfortunately, for the right reasons, then your economics on that 250 a month goes out the window for the whole darn year. And that was the lesson we learned in that phase. We, we sold those at a profit a couple of years ago. Oh, you know, nice. I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for that. But like those two phases were very, very informative for me to, and Jennifer just to say, look, that, that 400 unit apartment building, we can't go buy it ourselves. But if one tenant leaves that building, the 399 other tenants are still paying their rent. And it has cash flow. It's stable. People need places to rent. And quick call out to you, just by the way, on this diatribe. Uh, I'm sorry for going a long winded. That's great. Um, I mean, it's really remarkable in the year 2022 as of this recording. I know uh, it's not going to be as relevant perhaps in years to come, but I'll say it's so important for folks to understand now more than ever. Looking at data yesterday showing the list of markets where single family home buyers can't buy a home now because of higher interest rates and they're flocking over to be renters again in apartments. Right. And right. so when, it, when people are out there screaming recession and I am not an echo chamber guy, I, I actually do believe that, yeah, we're heading into the next phase of the cycle. And, and that, that's just how I can, economics and physics works. What goes up must come down. But frankly, the, the demand for these things is not going away. <laughs> that's right. And, and you, you know all this clearly, uh, you're right. experienced yeah. on this stuff in your journey, Tate. But like, I think folks tend to just talk themselves out of great ideas because like, we're not changing our investment thesis. We're just sharpening our pencils. And uh, yeah. I think ultimately, we're, we've leaned into this and done 37 deals now across multifamily and storage and a couple other odds and ends that are a bit more niche. But like those cash flow moments, we started before doing any of this actively, just dropping $25,000 as our first investment into a multifamily syndication that doubled our money within a two year or a two and a half year period. Yeah. And I was like, what is this? We didn't lift a finger for that, that, that return. When was yeah. this? Was this phase one, phase two? When, when was sorry, I, I jumped straight into phase three. That was phase three. Phase it was three. Like, okay. like we're, we're done with the local rental. It's too expensive. We're done. Yeah. And then, Phase two was like we're done with the with the turnkey and buying properties in other states because they're single family rentals and they're just a ton of work and they're volatile and etc. We're like we got to find something for our busy lives and we don't have the time. We're, we're, we're I have to go in bright bright eyed bushy tailed seven a.m. every morning to lead teams of people and inspire them and try to do my job serving them. And Jennifer has her own career, so we need something passive. And ultimately that led us to go and invest back in, you know, we started doing all this stuff in like 2016, 2017. And um, that's when it, it clicked for me when it was like, well, we've done enough of these passive investments and I know what I, what I don't know. I don't want to be, I'm not moving out of the Bay area, but I do know, I know I don't want anyone else to go through this experience that we just went through. And I'm getting asked about what we're putting our money into by all the folks in our network. Mm -hmm. So let's go let's combine the operational expertise that I bring and Jennifer, Jennifer bring to build a business that just helps people de-risk this darn thing. Cause they're not passive investors. Don't want to get on a plane. You know, I, I, right. I'm, I'm, I fly right. out to properties. I walk them and I, I meet with our partners and I join them in their GP teams, all this good stuff. Like we were chatting about ahead of time before we hit record today. And yep. um, passive yep. investors just, they'll jump into a deal because it just looks like a pretty PDF file and an investment summary, not realizing they're about to get into some hot water because the person's never done it before. Sure. <laughs> yeah. So you, you, you guys have taken your experience with what didn't work and what wasn't appealing and, and the inefficiencies of single family, uh, the inefficiencies of small scale. And you've, you've basically provided this vehicle so that others can fast track their progress and their, their trajectory, so to speak, and in investing basically having all the lessons that you guys learned underneath their belt by, by virtue of working with you and, uh, and having you to, in your words, de-risk this space for them, uh, which is such an amazing value that you're offering investors. 
And I'm sure that I'm sure it's got to be immensely gratifying. I just can't get over 37 deals. Is that all since, I mean, you guys started in 16, it sounds like 16, 17 or so when you were investing in the single family space and whatnot. Is that about right? Yeah, you know, in, in Madison investing as a business officially started in early 2018. Um, okay. I was out, already out there doing the all the stuff that, you, that you've done as well, Tate, which is just getting to know other people and like like yeah. humbling myself in front of them to the best of my ability to say, hey, how can I help? Like, here, I think I can add value to you, experienced operator. Like, how can I um, do more of this and help you out? Because I can bring... With with good reasonable self awareness, I know I can bring business acumen, structuring, you know, frameworking, business process. I can help with marketing infrastructure, all these things. And then, of course, I do know a lot of people who have been very successful in the tech world. So, like, there's an investor capital component there that is our core expertise here. And so, that's really how how it all started. It was um, around 2018 officially at the beginning. And you've done 37 deals since 2018, roughly. Correct. Yeah. yeah, that's just, that's, that's amazing, dude, that 10,000 plus doors. I mean, so many people put, you know, a goal up there of like, uh, you know, I want to do 500 doors in two years, or I want to do a thousand doors in three years or or a year or whatever that looks like, man, 10,000 doors in mm, what, four or five years now. Um, that's, such a great track record. And it sounds like, you know, you've had these uh, number of these go full cycle. Uh, so you've, you've got this proof of concept that's super solid behind you. So it sounds like you built just this, uh, really powerful company and, uh, and you guys are, are cooking, man. It's, it sounds awesome. No, well, it's really kind of you. I mean, yeah. frankly, that's coming in today. That's like very much how I'm feeling about you. <laughs> and so, oh, you know, it, it's the feelings are very much mutual today. I mean, it, I think real estate oftentimes in this industry, there, there's a double-edged sword stylistically that I think is helpful to mention just so folks can get a better sense of, 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 of who I am and who, and who we are and stuff. And, and then that's more so just, uh, People are very confident in real estate, but they're also very open and friendly and supportive generally. Like yeah. it's, a very, it's a very welcoming industry. And I think is, especially in commercial, on the commercial side of things, I think yeah. that's especially true. Yeah. I mean, coming yeah. from Silicon Valley, I got to say, talk about a place where, and, I, and I, I actually had a very positive experience overall in my W2 career. That's one thing I can't agree with in most of the investor network out here is like, I mean, in, in real estate investing is people tend to dig on the W two world really hard, yeah. And I cherished that. It was brutally mm -hmm. challenging at times, but that's how we grow, and that's how life is, anyways. Right, so, like, right. I, I look very favorably, but I will say this: is like I, I'm often told that I am too humble when it comes to sharing, like, oh, we did this or that, because like I just don't care about chest puffing stuff, you know. And the, and the, and there is a little bit of that in real estate. So, um, I learned that from like being in my dad's business and just seeing how all that networking happened early on. And I knew I just, that's kind of what scared me into tech. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. I, 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 I don't like the transactional nature necessarily of the short-term relationships that you see all over the place. We want right. to work with folks and I want to invest alongside real investors from all over the country that are like long, long view, slow wealth building people. Sometimes it's faster, of course, you know, to, to 2.7 average exit hold period for our deal so far. So it's like not that slow wealth, but it is slow wealth compared to let me go make a quick buck um, on on a deal with a total stranger. That's just not how we roll. And it's never been interesting. We're, we have like the best kind of boring deals, you know, yeah. and we want, yeah. we want relationships with people that are kind of going to turn into friends, frankly. Right. Well, let, let me just, let me cut to the chase here on something uh, that's, you know, that's kind of been, an obvious question in my mind through this whole conversation is, uh, you know, somebody like me, we're, we're, we're owners, operators, acquisition specialists, and we're really good at getting good deals. We're, we're good at our broker relations game. We're good at due diligence. We're, you know, we're, we're good at a lot of the aspects of, of that game. Um, quite frankly, you know, to be totally transparent equity the equity side of the, of the game has been uh, part of our business that has um, 
really i don't i want to say lag but it, it basically you know we we led our our business model off with going out and getting deals and then doing what it takes to get them done and what we're finding now that we're getting into nicer asset class deals better tenant bases um larger scale communities you know we're we're really sourcing a lot of class a stuff right now um yeah so equity is a challenge for us man it's it's a uh it's a it's a part of our business that we're we're kind of constantly working on uh we we do our own capital raising uh we have an investor pool investor club basically that people can join at investwithgreenlight.com little plug there but um you know so somebody like us my team greenlight uh the the four of us here at greenlight how do we go about you know kind of kicking off a relationship with you and and you know look at the possibilities of of potentially working together yeah well i mean Frankly, I, I appreciate you saying that and asking that question, Tate. I mean, kudos to you guys, though, in, in all seriousness. I think that as you can appreciate and you live and breathe every day professionally, I mean, I look back to those early moments in 2016-ish when I was deep into biggerpockets.com, not to get sure. free, but I think they kind of deserve it in a good way. Yeah, um, Bigger Pockets is great. Shout out. Yep. Huge, hugely positive, right? And yeah. uh, I, I look at that landscape and really when it all boils down to it folks are out there hustling to make their first deal and close their first deal either by buying the deal or find the money right and if i were to say like it what does every person out there need to focus on first in my humble opinion but is the hardest lift it is absolutely what you guys have already accomplished and that Mm -hmm. is if you can win deals and you can structure the deals and you can actually go build a broker network my goodness, I am looking at that like I I just have I praise you. I mean, I bow to you on that stuff because mm-hmm. it, it is it is incredibly uh, challenging and, and it takes consistency over the course of years. And yeah. so, um, yeah, I just wanted to share that first. But but yeah, I think for us, um, we learned. You know, you learn you, you take your licks on learning the hard way, but we also tried to apply a core principle to our business on decisions and mm. partnerships and deals mm-hmm. uh, that I, I borrowed from people way smarter than me in, in the tech world. And, and mm. I, I remember frameworking being that that learning. Like, how do you framework something? I'll make it very tangible. Like, you could framework anything. I remember a former CEO said that, and I was like, what the heck does this guy mean? <laughs> I was an engineer for a brief time in late high school doing my computer science and then early college before I was like, well, I'm going to go snowboard more and learn business and sociology. So I switched over and then I haven't done been an engineer since. But I, I, I understood frameworking enough to look further into it and then see how it's put in businesses. And for us, I was like, frameworking means it's a way to make great decisions quickly when they are typically made very slowly. Mm, gotcha. Big, you know, the biggest decisions in life are made very slowly, but we can't afford to do that. We can't afford to do that in real estate when there's whole periods of 30 days and below sometimes, and you got these competitive landscapes with tons of money ch- t- chasing too few deals. Yeah. And so we, we, we have a five-part framework we use uh, and we hold to it. All the way, we look at track record, approach, team, communications, and values. Mm-hmm. And, and mm-hmm. Uh, I, I do just ask, you know, usually when, when, a, when some folks are wanting to chat about it, it's never a no, it's really just, just, just like a, not yet, you know, and, sure. um, we just want folks to at least have gone a full cycle on, on, on a deal these days. And yep. another reason for that Tate, without putting some of the more passive folks to sleep out here, because this is way under discussed in my opinion, uh, for passive investors is that you heard not in my bio, like uh, FINRA is like F I N R A. Yeah. There's, you know, there's tax laws, there's, um, civil laws, there's all, there's all these different laws that we all have to adhere to as citizens. Right. And, um, securities laws, man, securities laws, <laughs> yeah. they're just, they're just as important as the rest. And absolutely. So I'm registered with FINRA, which is like a, you know, uh, related to the sec. And that is a deliberate choice that we made because, 
in 2020, we were like looking at the landscape of where all this real estate syndication stuff was going. And we're like, there's just a bunch of folks playing real fast and loose. And, and Mm -hmm. that's just not how we roll. I like the black and white. And so uh, this is a very wordy way of me saying not just my judgment, but we also have a, a compliance organization that has to review all of our stuff before we share it with investors too. And they look at they they have to sign off on that track record along with us. So mm-hmm. you know that's that that's part of our infrastructure that we deliberately baked in. And I I didn't enjoy passing all those tests. <laughs> right, I bet. <laughs> I, 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 I don't work. I don't enjoy filling out more forms and and having to you know really du- triple check that I send out the right um, investment projections and all this stuff. But that's the kind of diligence that I, I found to be lacking when mm-hmm. I was a passive investor. So um, I, I just wanted to share all that stuff, but really that, yeah. it just starts that way, you know, it's our track record approach, team communications values. That's kind of our five part framework. And we always put skin in the game first ourselves as LPs um, mm-hmm. uh, and see how that goes for three to six months. Got it. Got it. Cool. So, and then it's just really a matter of uh, just reaching out to you at, uh, is it madisoninvestment.com? Is that the best place to start that process? Yeah. And if you yeah. just shoot me a note, you know, uh, Spencer at madisoninvesting.com, yeah. um, best place to reach me. If, if folks are uh, passive investors themselves, then uh, yeah, I know you already mentioned it up front, but folks can just go to our website, madisoninvesting.com. And yeah. um, actually, we are going to be putting, finally launching a really awesome resource for passive investors in about two weeks. So by the time this comes out, it's probably going to be live if folks want to come check it out on the website. Yeah, this will be out. And uh we're recording this on September 6, 2022, probably come out in, uh, October ish. Um, so, so yeah. Oh, yeah. So t- yeah. T- talk a little bit about that, uh, about that resource. Yeah. You, you know, I, I think we tried to condense down, we did condense down all the key basic stages, uh, that we went through and only pulled out the salient crystallized points for how to be an effective passive investor. And the one section that mattered the most to share with others, because I don't see this discussed ever. And I arguably think without exaggeration, Tate, it is the most important passive investor step that people seem to bypass because they, it's the hardest. It it, it is for sure the hardest. And that is why, like, well, what's your why? And that's a financial question of setting a monthly goal. Like, is someone doing this for Cash flow? Okay, why? Is it because here, like, here are some real examples? Dual income couple, two senior software engineers at Facebook, they want to house the generation above them like a parent. Uh, they want to take care of their kids. They don't want to quit, don't want to pivot out of their career. They want to be able to have a soft landing and more swagger walking into the office for the next 15, 20 years of their career. So they want to get to $8,000 in monthly passive income from their investments. That is a clear cut goal. Yeah. And one one other one to share with folks would just be, we now work with some high net, high net worth folks that are serial entrepreneurs. Mm-hmm. You know, they still they're idea people first. They're not execution people first. They they become execution people, but they fly out with the ideas all the time. It's a gift. They don't really take the time, oftentimes, to set a clear goal because they want to get out of that game eventually. You know, they they, they want to sell that business. They want to sell their portfolio, whatever. And so saying, I need to hit ten to $20,000 in passive income per month, have they taken the time to, sh- to, to map out how they do that? <laughs> yeah. And so that was kind of the first resource that we honed in on for that. That, uh, that It's called the Blueprint for uh, Passive Investors. And so it's really designed just to be, you know, it's not going to do the work for them, of course, right. Uh, right. Right, but it, it is hopefully going to be one of many uh, arrows in the quiver uh, for them. And is, is that going to be available on the website? It will. Yeah. So madisoninvestment.com. Go there. Uh, by the time this is published, it'll be live and you guys can check that out uh, as passive investors. I got to ask you, uh, unfortunately, I can't believe this. We're running up against time. This has just flown by, but um, I, Sorry about that. no, no, it's, this has been just fantastic. But um, I got to ask you, you know, that's 10,000 plus doors, 37 deals. That's a lot of, of passive investors that you've managed to, uh, you know, nurture relationships with and get on board. Uh, what, are there any secrets or any, any, any kind of special sauce that you have that, uh, that 
that you would attribute to attracting that volume of investors and that quality of investor? Gosh, this is a fun topic. It really is. Like I, I, I love this topic because it really is such a human question and that's how we all connect. And so like, yeah, I, I like bulleted lists and frameworks as you could probably tell Tate. So sorry if I'm overdoing it on those. Um, first and foremost, I would say everyone starts with just like we did your first degree connections, you know, and that's how yeah. I did too. People family, call, friends. Yep. family and friends. Right. And yeah. I ironically, a lot of family are some of the last to ever invest. Right. But um, the, the thing that really honed in on for us was define, you got to start with, I think in real estate investing community, they call it the avatar, you know, like define yeah. who you're actually connecting with. We did that too. And we got real detailed. I went out then, and this, this is all about Jennifer's brilliance and experience speaking. We went out and I did 50 interviews with people in my second first and second degree network. And I reached out, this was not a pitch by design. It was like pure learning exercise. And it was mm-hmm. like a set list of questions because we wanted to nail down who are we actually helping and what is it that they consider help? And like, how do they behave? How do they go? How do they goal set? How, how do they, what do they want to do all this for? Are they terrified of alternative assets? You know, like, like mm-hmm. why all this stuff? So that was all just the deep learning instead of just rushing into doing. And that was the big first step. Second step, I would just say would be like uh, doing the unscalable thing. Ironically, uh, we don't go out and try to build a giant funnel, uh, a marketing funnel. Sorry. Okay. Um, okay. I, I I don't plan on going out and doing any broad forum communication, but maybe occasional discussion like I'm enjoying here with you, occasionally doing a panel at a conference or something. But I say all that because I know about myself and being true to myself that I'm an introvert, man. Like I like one-to-one conversations. I, I can't go network like a power networker. I can't do that. And so I can't wear that face all day, every day. And I think that's important to be self-aware of when people start kicking this stuff off because I know how to get, how to put myself in front of another human being and just be there. Listen, really listen, really connect. And I, and I still onboard 100% of our investors personally. Like I, like we, we're hiring a, our first full-time team member. We've had a contractor, a set of uh, third-party organizations that we have long-term partners with, but this is an important point that wouldn't work for everybody. This just works for us. Like I, I know we're trying to work with fewer, bigger investors that want a long-term relationship and will trust, will trust us with, I mean, we have one person, you know, investing like a, doesn't always happen this way. Some folks do $25,000, $50,000 checks per deal. Some folks do $780,000 or we have might have a million dollar check in a deal right now. And so it's it runs the gamut. They would never consider doing that with a total stranger unless they were no longer a total stranger and they were a legitimate relationship and a, even a friend. And mm-hmm. that's the, I, I think that was really the difference is it's a patience game. Man. And it's yeah. it's. And I did post roughly 900 times on LinkedIn myself over the course of a two and a half year period with handwritten things that I did myself was not outsourced. And so I don't do that anymore, but uh, that helped. Do you still have a LinkedIn uh, marketing program that you've maybe outsourced or leveraged? You know, I, ironically, I, I just kind of stepped back from it. Um, and okay. and I, it's, not, it's not not because I didn't like it. it. It was just because I couldn't do it well anymore. Uh, I was too busy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and so there's also a couple of things about making sure that I adhere compliantly because there's all kinds of stuff I won't bore people with where it's like, you know, going out and make, making promises on social media, which we've never done talking about deals. That's how people get in very hot water. And so uh, it's just about making authentic connections. And we, we didn't go out beyond LinkedIn on social media. Now it was really just sticking to what we know. So yeah. I, I- Listeners, this is a big takeaway here. LinkedIn is legit. It's very vibrant. It's very active. People that are on LinkedIn are very serious about what they're doing typically. And uh, there are a lot of uh, equity sources, uh, passive investors, and uh, you know people that you want to connect with on LinkedIn. And there's ways of doing that uh, that are highly effective. Really what Spencer did, just that consistency, 900 posts, man. I love that you've got all your things counted too. I love like, you know, exactly how many you did. And, um, you know, 
that's going to create a a presence that people respect and understand and and will recognize uh, will recognize Spencer as the expert here that um, has you know great opportunities to offer. So one last thing, and we we are right up against time here. I just got to ask you, uh, what's it like to work with your wife? Are you CEO and she's COO? Is that the arrangement? That's correct. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. we could probably do a whole podcast on that one. I know. Um, I, I love this subject too. Yeah. I, honestly, I cannot envision anything else. Oh, and that's beautiful. It's, um, yeah. The, the one thing I was I would say is that we took, it's not for everybody. Clearly, it's, it's really not. Everyone's family and relationships are so different. And we started goal setting at the beginning of all this. And it was a pretty hairy couple of weekends. We cleared the calendar kids with, with, with some family and we sat down and we hashed things out. There was, there was tears, there was reconciliation, there was laughter, mm. there was, there was clear cut KPIs because we both speak the language of business from our two careers, but we had never brought that together in our context. And mm. we're still waiting to get clarity on when we're supposed to be in our business hat versus our spouse hat. But I, I think that, that that switches back and forth depending on the time of day. So uh, it's I would think that's an art. There's gotta be, there's gotta be a real art to that. And, and there's gotta be a, a deep trust and friendship, I would think between the two of you to uh, to really negotiate that aspect of things really well because those those lines have got to get blurry from time to time. Oh, respect at the baseline has got to be the. You're absolutely right. Um, and respect, I'd have to say, even beyond mm. the trust, it's just like I respect. You have to have that mutual respect so deeply to be like I know what you're, you're capable of, and yeah, you you do you, you know. And but yeah. I'm going to tell you, like, and we very much tend to share with each other when we don't think that something is the correct path. And that's where a lot of couples stop short because they're trying to avoid conflict at all times. And I get yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. I love it. Well, listen, next time we have you on the show, I'd love to have her on with you. And uh, in, in all seriousness, it, I think it'd be a, a fascinating uh, discussion and uh, to get into the dynamics of partnership, because this is a team sport, as we, as we mentioned all the time on the show, uh, uh-huh. whether, whether your team is your wife, your, your brother, your best friend in my case, uh, you know, like th- that is, it's key. You can't do this business on your own. And, uh, and I love, I, we were talking offline Spencer before the show started about, uh, this power couple concept where, you know, you've got, you've got this, this marriage, this love relationship that is also serving both parties as a powerful business relationship and is making a huge impact on other people's lives. And that to me is so exciting. And I just, I congratulate you guys Thank it, you. immeasurably for, for, uh, for being able to navigate that. That's, you know, there, it's, it's gotta be tricky from time to time. I would think you mentioned there were tears. I'm, I'm sure that's the truth. I'm sure that happens. Like um, it gets real and, you know, it's gotten real with my partner, my best friend, Carl, who, um, you know, we've, we've had some rocky, rocky parts in our business over the last, uh, 11 years or so. And, and, uh, there've been tears, man, on both sides. So I get it. I get it. It's, um, but it, you know, those are, those, those are the relationships and the connections and the alliances that really make us powerful. They really enable us to do what we do. And, uh, so I, I, man, I just wish you guys all the best. I'm, I'm really excited to, uh, you know, to have made this connection with you guys and, and, uh, really excited to see kind of what, you, what you guys end up doing next. Speaking of on that, when we'll, we'll kind of wrap up with this, but, uh, what's the future hold for you guys in Madison? Yeah. And thank you so much, Tate. This was a yeah. really fun conversation and just totally. thanks for across the, the full gamut, you know? And so, I think, uh, yeah, I, well, and I think next for us, frankly, it, this is not going to sound as glamorous. I would just say we are t- holding the line. We're holding the course. Yeah. And, and 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 a question that I'm we often discuss across the industry, I would say, of entrepreneurship as well as real estate, is people are always saying, "How much growth are you going for next year?" We are not going for 10x growth. That is not something I want to bring over and borrow from the tech world of of very hardcore pressure. Because that takes away from why the heck we're doing all this. It's to serve yeah. people and to be a present father and uh, to my kids and good dad, good husband. And so yeah. we're trying to put great deals for the context 
of the market yeah. in front of folks that we believe in, that we've already invested in with the same team. And, and sometimes that's multifamily that we're not changing from that. Um, but there's also storage. Sometimes there's even, I invested in, you know, I sent the biggest wire I've ever sent for an LP investment just last week into, uh, into a deal and it was for ATMs, you know? So it's, it really, oh, wow. it, it really runs the gamut. And, uh, that's the kind of stuff that we're aiming to do is not be dogmatic about, uh, asset classes, but while still holding the course on the ones that we know to be the, 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 the right core of our portfolio. Yeah. Yeah. Love it. Spencer, it has been amazing, dude. I hate to cut this off because uh, we, we just, we're, we're covering some really amazing stuff, but I do need to. So, so once again, for people to reach you uh, as passive investors, uh, in, you know, interested in, in opportunities, it's uh, madisoninvestments.com. Uh, people that might want to talk about doing business with you might want to drop you a note at spencer at madisoninvestments.com. Uh, is there anything else that, that we missed that you might want to share with, uh, with our audience? Well, it's been a pleasure. And, and and I just wanted to make sure folks are going to the right place because there's so many Madisons. It's uh so it's Madison Investing. Investing. I'm sorry. My no, 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 seriously, no worries. Um, but it's madisoninvesting.com and folks can for sure reach out if they want to drop me a line. Uh Spencer at madisoninvesting.com. But yeah, go. come check out that new resource we're launching in a couple of weeks. And that should be helpful, hopefully, for uh for some passive investors just trying to navigate their first or or even their tenth uh, LP investment. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Well, dude, I really appreciate this. It's been a fascinating conversation. I love the connection that uh, that we that we share here, and uh, I look forward to to continuing our discussions and continuing our relationship in the future. And you know, for you listeners, like we talk a, a lot about being a thought leader in this space, and you know, obviously, being a podcast host is an example of that. Being a meetup host, being a, a speaker being a, an author, a uh, blogger, those are all ways of being a thought leader. And what you've just seen is one of the biggest reasons for, uh, for you know, for doing that. And that's, that's forging these connections and these relationships uh, and, and forging a, a, an element of trust and respect and admiration with people that, that you connect with. Uh, through these thought leadership platforms. And if it wasn't for the podcast, like I wouldn't know Spencer, you guys wouldn't know Spencer and we wouldn't have this connection, these opportunities. So, you know, always be considering like, how can I can contribute as a thought leader as well? Because that's a big part of uh, potentially building your business and you can do it without it. You, you certainly can, um, but it's, it, but it's, it sure is a great uh, addition. So, uh, so Spencer, thanks a ton. I really appreciate you, man. Um, listeners, thank you. We love you guys. We're so grateful for your, for your listenership and appreciate you listening to another uh, episode and listening to the end of another episode. You guys are doing the good things that it takes to learn. You know, Spencer mentioned phase one was all about learning for him. 400 plus podcasts and uh, 24 books. And like, that's, that's that specialized knowledge base that you need to forge. So, um, so yeah, so by all means, keep it up guys. And, uh, we're, we're just super grateful for you. So, uh, everybody take care and we'll, we'll check you on the next episode of the apartment gurus. Take care, everybody. This has been the apartment gurus with Tate Seymour. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to subscribe and leave a rating and review on your favorite podcast platform to contact Tate go to www.investwithgreenlight.com for access to his investor portal and Calendly link. He loves to hear from you and thanks you for being a valued listener. Just a reminder that you are the guru. See you on the next episode of The Apartment Gurus.